here for AP World History Modern. Today, we are going to be talking about non-aligned nations and the end of the Cold War. This is actually our last lecture for Unit 8. I know it seems like this unit has had very few lectures in it and that we've gone through it really quickly. Some of that is purposeful given the circumstances. In class, we'll spend a little bit more time on these topics, digging into a little bit more detail. But for our purposes, I want to make sure you know what you need to know. So let's think back to what we've already been learning about. How were the experiences of Asia, Africa, and Latin America similar in this time period? So today we are going to be talking about non-aligned nations and the end of the Cold War. Our objective is going to line up with topic 8.8 .8 of the overview. Explain how political changes in this period from 1900 to present led to territorial, demographic, and nationalist developments. So I know, once again, it seems like we aren't spending enough time on this, but considering that some of our earlier units covered three centuries, and this unit covers less than 100 years, I think it actually balances out in the end. So let's start by talking about the third world. Remember, the third world were countries that had not chosen or purposefully decided not to choose to side with either the Soviet Union or the United States. So non-aligned nations are developing countries that announced their neutrality during the Cold War. So this is an example of the formation of groups to oppose the existing world order. It was a way for non-aligned nations to get money and support from one or both superpowers. They could play the superpowers off each other. Well, um, the United States is promising to give us a million dollars in financial aid. Soviet Union, what can you offer? Right, It's a way for these developing nations to take advantage of the system, and I really can't blame them for it. It's also a way to keep these mega superpowers out of their country, to keep them from meddling in their politics. Right, Many of these regions had only recently become independent, and they do not want to continue having foreign intervention into their politics. We also see during the 20th century a lot of proxy wars. These are local or regional wars in which superpowers armed, trained, and financed combatants. So the Korean War, the Vietnam War um, are a couple to name a few. There are many more than that. Um, well, if we're thinking about what's going on economically globally, between 1932 and 1982, the USSR and China have complete government control of the economy. And in general, we see all over the world, governments are taking a more active role. Even in the United States, the government will take a more active role to promote economic development. Look at the New Deal. Look at the way the Marshall Plan helped governments take an active role in the economy in Europe. So in general, in the 20th century, after the 1930s, so after the Great Depression, we see that governments take a much more active role in their economic processes. This is, of course, a change from the laissez-faire policies that dominated the 19th century. So give some examples of first, second, and third world countries. What are some proxy wars and how do you know that they are a proxy war? Okay, let's talk a little bit about Asia. We haven't talked about Asia in a few lectures. So let's return to Japan. If you remember, Japan was really devastated by World War II, not only because of the two atomic bombs dropped on it, but also the firebombing of Tokyo the way that the war absorbed so much of their resources and manpower, the loss of life and loss of reputation. 
So Japan is completely focused on rebuilding their country and economy. And the United States is taking a very active role in this. We're occupying Japan at first. We are making sure that, sure, you can develop, but like we don't want you to go back to your fascist ways, and we don't want you to become communist like China. So we will see peace treaties with Southeast Asian countries will be arranged. So Japan will have reparations that they will have to pay to the nations that they had conquered. And these um, reparations would be payable in either goods and services. Japan will keep close ties with the West and their new constitution will limit the military size and thus the spending possible on the military. So instead, Japan's going to focus on using its resources to rebuild its infrastructure and its industry. They'll build up the electrical grid, steel production, um, shipbuilding, and unlike some of our other major world powers, they will avoid heavy defense spending during the Cold War. So Japan's going to really rapidly return to its level of development and take an active role in world trade. We see that by the 70s, they are starting to export cars again and actually present some competition to the United States on the global market. What about China? When we last talked about China, the um, Mao Zedong's Communist Party had pushed the Guomindong out of China. So... Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists had fled to Taiwan and set up their own government, and Mao Zedong and the Communist Party has full control of China. Well, the Soviet Union, of course, is going to be Mao's number one ally, but we will see a split in this relationship as the Soviet Union begins to move away from Stalinism, right? We talked about that shift And China is unwilling to be subordinate to the Soviet Union. They don't want to become another satellite state. So instead, China's going to focus on building up their economy. And one of the ways this is going to be called is the Great Leap Forward. It's essentially implementing Stalin's five-year plans in China, but it is not going to work I mean, we know that Stalin's five-year plans caused many people to die from famines, and there's a lot of similarities to be looked at between these two attempts at industrialization. But Russia and the Soviet Union will be able to industrialize much more effectively under the five-year plans than China will under the Great Leap Forward. So just like in the five-year plans, Mao's going to institute mass collectivization of agriculture. The goal here is to maximize output on a small scale, right? Instead of forcing everyone to move to the big cities, to factories like Stalin did, instead, uh, Mao's going to try and institute village-level industries. So you would have like a small iron forge in your backyard. And if you thought, I don't know how to forge iron, like doesn't that seem dangerous? You're right. It is dangerous. The iron is all going to be really brittle and terrible because it turns out your average person can't just make iron in their backyard. The collectivization of agriculture is going to lead to massive famines. And so in general, the Great Leap Forward is a failure. 20 to 30 million Chinese will die from this. So again, if you haven't watched this crash course, I would encourage you to do so. And if you want to jump in at just the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, start at um, minute six. But the Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution was a campaign by Mao to purge the Communist Party of his opponents and to instill revolutionary values in a young generation. So China can only advance when its traditional past has been destroyed. That's the view of the Cultural Revolution. And this is in part a response to the Great Leap Forward, right? So the Great Leap Forward's not working so well. 
your um, many Chinese citizens are still very traditional, right? One of the things that we've been emphasizing all year in terms of China is continuity. For hundreds of years, they followed that same dynastic cycle that tradition and continuity were two hallmarks of China. And so now with Mao Zedong, you can't just be like, oh, nope, stop ancestor worship. Like we're just going to stop all of these traditions that have been in China for literally hundreds of years. So with the Great Leap Forward not working so well, people are starting to think like, ooh, I don't know if all this change is actually worth it, if it's working. And so with the Cultural Revolution, Mao is going to be able to um, really, oops, I'm sorry, really um, push back against any critics. So he's going to organize youth, teenagers, into Red Guard units. These units will criticize and purge teachers, party officials, and intellectuals for bourgeoisie values. Basically, anyone who disagreed with Mao and these communist values would be purged. So think very much like the purges of Stalin in the 1930s. 500,000 will die, 3 million will be purged, and it's a deliberate attempt to destroy Chinese history. We see that artifacts, um, art, literature, historians, like there's this art, poetry, um, music. There is this massive loss of historical knowledge in China because of the Cultural Revolution, in which it was very purposefully destroyed. So, by 1971, even Mao admits that this has gotten out of hand. So, we see that the purposeful attempts to destroy Chinese history stops, but we will see that the Chinese Communist government will continue to restrict artistic and intellectual activity. And we still see that today with the way the Chinese government practices such extreme censorship of critics and artistic movements, the way that they continue to oppress anyone who does not fall in line with the Chinese Communist Party's values. Just look at their treatment of the Uyghur peoples in Western China. Um, It's pretty terrible. The Chinese government is terrifying. So again, watch this if you haven't, but let's do a practice question. So pause this video and read through this quote from Mao Zedong in 1955. So I want you to pause, read through it, and then we're going to go over three questions. And again, I'm going to go through them quickly, but I recommend you pause as each slide changes for you to practice. And I did not create this question. Um, This is a question that I got from um, the textbook, The Earth and Its Peoples. So number one, Mao Zedong's words in the excerpt can be best used to support which of the following assertions about communism in the 20th century? Okay, do you have the answer? The answer is B, the growth of Chinese communism resulted in increased government control over the economy. Okay, number two, the level of government control indicated by Mao Zedong's comments most closely resembles that of, are you ready? Do you know the answer? The correct answer is going to be A, Stalin's nearly complete control of the Soviet national economy with the five-year plans. Mao Zedong's words in the excerpt support which of the following conclusions about China's involvement in the Cold War? Pause and figure out the answer on your own. Are you ready? The answer is going to be B, China's governmental concepts generally led it to support the Soviet Union across national boundaries. Good job, guys. All right, let's switch gears. Let's go to the Middle East. So we see lots of nationalism in the Middle East, um, specifically 
in Egypt and Turkey. The impact of European imperialism still linger in non-Western regions, and we see that especially here in the Middle East. Let's look specifically at Israel. So in the 1930s and 40s, we see lots of violent conflict between Arab, Palestinians, and European Jews over the territory of Palestine. It's clear in the 1930s and 40s, before Israel is even a state, that these two people groups won't be able to live peacefully together. Now, I just want to emphasize the issue here isn't the fact that one group is Muslim and one group is Jewish. The issue here is that one group is European and one group is native to the populate is native to this land, right? The roots of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict don't have anything to do with religion. It has to do with European occupation of foreign land. But in 1948, Israel is born out of European guilt, and immediately the Arab neighbors declare war. It's the Arab-Israeli war. And it makes sense, right? If all of a sudden England said, you know what, Um, we're going to take Guatemala for ourselves. Well, Mexico, Belize, um, El Salvador, they would all be like, "Um, no, you're not. Like, we don't want to start this again. So the Arab neighbors declare war on Israel, but Israel has the support of the U.S. military and European forces. And so Israel wins. The result is 700,000 Palestinians become refugees, and they are still refugees. We have massive refugee camps in Israel, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Jordan, and Egypt. I've visited some of these refugee camps. Refugee camps are not designed to um, function for almost 100 years. In 1967, we have another attempt at war. Israel and Egypt fight over the Sinai Peninsula, and Israel wins and expands. This is known as the Six-Day War, and it again creates more Palestinian refugees. So every step of the way, we see that Israel's territory is expanding, and the Palestinian territory is shrinking. So you have the creation of the Palestine Liberation Organization under Yasser Arafat, And they are going to fight back against the Israeli government using guerrilla warfare and terrorist tactics. So here's the problem with the Israeli-Palestinian conflicts is that the way the Palestinians have fought back hasn't been exactly honorable either. Bombing school buses, attacking Israeli children and markets, these are not the actions of... um, a honorable army, right? These are the actions of terrorists. Now, one might argue that the Palestinians don't have any other options, but there's always another option than destroying um, and deliberately attacking civilians. And yet we'll see that the IDF, the um, Israeli Defense Force, will use counterstrikes that involve assassinations and bombings as well. So, Here's the problem with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is there's no real good guys. Israel has done some very terrible things to the Palestinian people, but the Palestinians have not reacted well and have done terrible things to Israeli civilians as well. Innocent people die and are impacted by this conflict on a great scale. And it's easy to paint one group as the villain and the other group as innocent victims. The fact of the matter is neither side is innocent and neither side is um, completely the villain either. So the fact of the matter is the rest of the world doesn't really care until oil becomes a concern. So in 1960, OPEC Um, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries is created. And after the Yom Kippur War in 1973, which is Israel versus Syria and Egypt, and which Israel wins again, OPEC will vote for an embargo against the United States because the U.S. supported Israel. So 
after the Yom Kippur War in 1973, in which Israel goes to war with their neighbors, OPEC will choose um, will vote to not export any oil to the United States because the United States supported Israel. So this is the first time we're seeing oil being used as an economic weapon. The embargo will be lifted, and with the Camp David Accords, we will see a agreement reached between Israel and Egypt. And you have sort of a temporary peace, but you're going to have more conflicts in the 80s and 90s and even to today. We also see during the 20th century, the emergence of advocacy. So we have the emergence of environmental concerns. For a long time, we have been ignoring the impact of pesticides, herbicides, and air pollution. Well, with the atomic bombs especially, and the very clear impact of um, DDT um, on um, South Pacific islands, radiation due to the atomic bombs, increased air pollution, we see that waves of student unrest in the 1970s, as well as protests, will lead governments to start taking actions towards sustainability. So in the United States, you have the Clean Air Act in 1970. You have the creation of the EPA and Earth Day. Also, the rise in oil prices in the later part of the 20th century makes people realize that systems need to change. Now, obviously, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done here, but we start seeing environmentalist movements in the later half of the 20th century. We also see the emergence of second wave feminism. So first wave feminism is suffrage, right? The right to vote. Second wave feminism is going to emphasize equality between men and women. So in the 1950s, the number of working women increased. And we also see family rights increasing, easier access to divorce, abortions, birth control, daycare. And we see the decline of birth rates in the 1960s due to the pill, due to birth control. It's hard to overstate what a change for women's lives um, is birth control. Suddenly, you can have sex without worrying about getting pregnant. Suddenly, you can choose to put off having children until after you finish your career goals or your education. It's called the sexual revolution. So we start to see women really advocating for greater and greater rights. And indeed, we're seeing women advocating for equal treatment, especially in the workplace. So in 1966, you have the formation of NOW, National Organization of Women, which are going to advocate for women's rights. In the 1970s, women had 44% of the total jobs in Western countries. And we see that divorce rates increase as family roles adjust to women working so much. So in the 1970s, you have this deliberate movement of second wave feminism, which will emphasize equality between men and women, will downplay domestic roles, will advocate for women's sexual and reproductive rights. Look at Roe v. Wade, which will emerge during this time. And yet this is going to basically only happen in Western countries, right? This is going to be the United States and Western Europe. And as it is, this is going to be primarily a movement of wealthy and middle-class white women, right? It's not going to be addressing the needs of women of color or disabled women. Or in these non-Western countries, you will see a lot of resistance to this. Right? The non-Western countries tend to have more traditional views in small communities and resisted Western birth control measures. So a ro robust feminist movement in industrialized nations included changes to morals and sexual practices. All right, 
What about changes in economic and technology? Well, economies are growing in Western Europe across the 1950s, and the United States has really the dominant economy due to the way our other industrial nations were impacted post-World War II. Europe will see an influx of migration from Africa, the Middle East, and Asia to serve as immigrant laborers. We see an increase in consumerism, ownership of goods like televisions, refrigerators, cars expanded widely, which will also increase pollution and the use of oil. We see the green revolution increases food production as you have new seeds and fertilizers diffusing around the world. This will lead to global population growth. And we see new scientific discoveries, like in the 1950s, the discovery of DNA opens up the realm of genetics. We have ultrasounds and immunizations. In the 1950s, we have the creation of the polio vaccine and antibiotics. And yet, we continue to see economic inequality as especially immigrants into these Western nations experience discrimination and low-wage employment and we see economic um, imperialism keeping developing countries from reaching the same level as the Western neighbors. So this is a great crash course. It's on the United States specifically, um, but it really gives you a good look on some of the things that were happening in the 60s and 70s. So how do we see environmental, gender, and technological concerns playing out today? Okay, and I want you to explain the causes and consequences of Chinese adoption of communism, explain the causes and effects of movements to redistribute economic resources, and think about political change. All right, let's return to the Middle East. So we see that in Iran, we have the Iranian Revolution. So Iran is ruled by a monarch, the Shah, prior to this point. And the Shah was put into power in the 1950s by the CIA. So <laughs> he is very resented by the people, and his government is corrupt, brutal, and frankly, ineffective. So in the 1970s, we start to see resistance movements led by the Ayatollah Ruhula Khomeini. This is a Shia philosopher and cleric who's going to lead the overthrow of the Shah of Iran in 1979 and create the Islamic Republic of Iran. So we see massive protests force the Shah to leave, and the monarchy ends in 1979. So in the Islamic Republic of Iran, this is a theocracy. Khomeini has the final say. So you have a parliamentary regime that imposes religious control over legislation and public behavior. And in 1979, you have Iranian radicals capture the U.S. embassy and hold hostages for 444 days. In Iraq, you have Saddam Hussein emerge as president from 1979 onwards until the American invasion in 2003. When um, the um, Iraqi military under Saddam Hussein begins to use chemical warfare against the um, Kurds in an attempt at ethnic cleansing and then invades Kuwait will lead to George H.W. Bush sending the military in to push the Iraqi army back into its borders in probably the U.S.'s most successful military engagement since World War II. In Afghanistan, we see that the Soviets invade in the 70s. So the U.S., Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan pay, equip, and train Afghan rebels to fight against the Soviets. They're known as the Taliban. So 
they are very effective against the Soviets. They, the Soviets leave, the rebels take charge, and all of a sudden you have a civil war. So basically since then, you have had an unstable government with the um, U.S. invading in 2002 and since then an ongoing conflict with the Taliban. All right, great crash course on Iran. I really encourage you to watch it. But how did the Cold War impact politics in the Middle East in the 1970s and 80s? All right, what about in Asia? Well, we see after World War II, governments in East Asia more actively encouraged and promoted export-oriented markets. So you have the emergence of the Asian tigers, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. They will all become economic powers in the 1970s and 80s due to their inexpensive labor, strong technical education, substantial capital reserves, and support for industrialization. Japan has crazy economic growth, but it experiences a huge economic depression in the 1990s. And so you have these new industrialized countries. In East Asia, we are still going to see conflict, however. So quickly, what is ethnic cleansing? And can you think of some examples of ethnic cleansing in the 20th century? So some examples you should know is that the increase in ethnic cleansing and genocide in the 20th century is in part a result of the proliferation of warfare during the 20th century. We just see warfare can be done on a much larger scale. If you want to kill a group of people in the olden days, you'd have to go you know, house to house with your sword. It takes a long time. Now you just drop one bomb. So in Cambodia, you have the Cambodian genocide by Pol Pot under the Khmer Rouge. In, um, that's going to be in the 80s. In Rwanda in the 90s, you have the conflict between the Hutus and the Tutsis in which the Hutus slaughter the Tutsis. And then in Bosnia, you have in the 90s, the conflict between the Serbs and the Bosnian Muslims. We could spend an entire day just on these conflicts. You could spend an entire class just on ethnic conflict and genocide in the 20th century. But for our purposes, it's just useful for you to know that these are happening and that they are a result of increased weaponry on a large scale in the 20th century. Okay, what about China? So in 1976, Mao will die. And after his death, just like after Stalin's death, we see the uh, state beginning to relax their control over the economy and beginning some economic reforms. So Deng Xiaoping is going to be the guy who really leads this reemergence of China into the global economy. So you see more allowing of initiatives and private individuals are allowed to start to accumulate wealth. We see lots of direct foreign investment in China. And so we see sort of these dual industrial sectors emerging. One modern, efficient, and connected to the international markets, and one directed by political decisions. So if in China, you sort of have these two sides of the economy, one that functions much more like a capitalist economy and one that still functions like a communist one. But in general, we see the economy grows. So this will lead to some um, protest movements because as people experience more prosperity and they feel that they can actually speak against the government a little bit and they see the prosperity experienced in non-communist states, students especially will start to speak out against the communist regime. So... You see protests by students and intellectuals in the 1980s demanding more democracy and the end to corruption. In 
hundreds of thousands of protesters gather in Beijing and refuse to leave. And after weeks of a standoff, we see that tanks roll in and kill hundreds and arrest thousands. So in Tiananmen Square, we see this is a site where Chinese students and workers gathered to demand greater political openness. And this demonstration is crushed by the Chinese military. So it becomes really clear that while China is willing to open up its economy a little bit, it is not willing to open up any sort of social or political criticism, right? Yeah, you can make more money, but we still have complete control over behavior and dialogue. So I would like you to compare and contrast China, India, and Japan at the beginning and then at the end of the 20th century. All right, let's finish up. Let's talk about the end of the Cold War. Almost done. So in the 1980s, we see the emergence of conservative politics around the world. Western nations see economic recessions in the 1970s. And this sort of causes some disillusion with the liberal policies input in the 60s. So in the United States, Ronald Reagan will be elected. And in the UK, Margaret Thatcher will be elected. So both of these conservative um, leaders will take a much harsher stance against the Soviet Union. Reagan will sponsor the expansion of weapon systems and will increase military spending. And these conservative politicians will criticize social welfare programs. But we'll see that the economy will grow. So one of the ways that the Soviet Union will start to see some struggles is because Reagan increases military spending. And the Soviet Union will try to keep up with the weapons production in the United States, and they simply don't have the money for it. So this will lead to a collapse of the Soviet economy. The fact of the matter is by the 1990s, the Cold War is virtually over, and the U.S. is really the world's only superpower. So how, let's make this ending official. So Mikhail Gorbachev is going to be the head of the Soviet Union from 1985 to 1991. His liberalization movements will improve relations from the West, but will cause him to ultimately lose power because his reforms will lead to the collapse of communist governments in Eastern Europe. So Mikhail Gorbachev will allow for basically criticism, right? Liberalization. You can have freedom of movement. Um, you can have Western stuff. You can criticize the government. And it turns out once you allow that, people don't actually want a communist government in Eastern Europe. Oops. So you have two terms you should know. One is glasnost, which means openness. It's this um, cr um, policy that allows for criticism of the government and the communist par party. You should also know perestroika, which is a policy, policy of restructuring that was the centerpiece of Gorbachev's efforts to liberalize communism in the Soviet Union. What's the message of this political cartoon? Perestroika, whether he intended it or not, leads to the end of the Soviet Union. So, this is a short video. It's really good. It looks at um, perestroika and the end of the Soviet Union. But with Glasnost, people start to demand change. And they open themselves up to change, which accelerates more change. So Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Bulgaria all decide to ditch communism in 1989. Romania tries to resist Right? They want to maintain communism, but their leader is overthrown and executed. So Romania has a civil war. It, it ends um, communism violently. So 
In 1990, we have the fall of the Berlin Wall, and Germany is reunified for the first time since 1945. Same year, we have Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia all gaining independence, these Baltic states. In 1991, we have the official end of the Soviet Union, and Boris Yeltsin is elected president of the Republic of Russia. So, what forces led to the collapse of the Soviet Union? And if you haven't watched it yet, I really encourage you to watch this crash course on the Cold War. It gives you a really good overview of it. But guys, that's it. That's the end of Unit 8. So I would like you to explain the causes of the end of the Cold War. I also want you to be able to explain how political changes in the period from 1900 to the present led to territorial, demographic, and nationalist developments. Thanks for listening. As always, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask, and you will find more videos in our Unit 8 and 9 playlist.